Just a little brief history um, for those of you who have no idea who I am. Um, we, uh, my husband and I um, have been married for 20 years now. We got married when we were 12. So, um, um, we started out in Oklahoma and um, just were some kids who had nothing better to do because there's not much to do in Oklahoma um, than sit around and, and write songs and that's kind of how it started. I'm a PK, I'm a preacher's kid, um, owe so much to my parents for the way that they reared me just even from, I remember probably my first solo in church, I was eight years old and I remember my dad came to me and he said, I want you to find a song that ministers to your heart and then I want you to share it with the people. And I think back on that, you know, and think what a way to lead as a dad, you know, not just, hey, you can sing so good, honey, why don't you share your talent with our people, but find a song that ministers to your heart and then share it with the people. And so from a very young age, I started ministering because that was just sort of the way that they set the tone for me. So they were sort of, I call my parents my first worship leaders, even though, he was more of a teaching pastor, but my mother, my mother played the piano and um, probably, you know, went through, I remember just after school on afternoons, my mom would play through like, um, I don't know, did you, have y'all listened to like, did you have Sandy Patty, you know, here in the 80s? She would go through a whole, you know, Sandy Patty book and then Amy Grant and I would sing and she was so gracious to sit and just let me learn how to find my voice basically and... Um, but anyway, Nathan, I met Nathan when I was 19, and he was um, making music and leading worship with a guy named Charlie Hall. And they had a um, band, just a really unique name, called Nathan and Charlie. And um, <laughs> it was a natural fit for me just to kind of join into what those guys were doing, um, even as we were just dating. And Nathan, they were so sweet to let me just in and um, invite me in. And they were the first guys that I had ever met that were worshipers of Jesus. I'd never seen that before. I had seen guys who were Christians, but I was basically ruined after that, after I met them and just saw their heart for Jesus, and I was smitten for one of them, um, Nathan. And we've made music together all these years, um, but kind of the beginning of how we really connected with passion was just through the Holy Spirit, really. Um, in our uh, little apartment when we first got married, I remember just, we had no idea what was going on, but I remember Nathan would be on the piano and I would be singing something and I l literally remember a few times just going face down on the carpet um, with these songs coming to us. And we, I was like, you know, kind of in the States, if you're raised Southern Baptist, you know, you don't fall face down on the carpet. Um, so I was just conservative, you know, Baptist girl, and I'm just going, what's happening to me, you know, and, and the Holy Spirit would just fall in our little apartment, and we um, had this little handful of songs, and we were getting bootleg copies of, from England from this guy, Matt Redman, who was just, you know, kind of a young guy then, and Martin Smith, and this whole worship movement was just beginning, and we, the church was going from singing these songs, you know, just about God to singing it straight to him, and it was this huge shift and so exciting, and our language at that point was not, like, about worship songs. It was, like, is renewal happening where you are? It was, that was what our hearts were after was revival and renewal, and so that just was our prayer, and we never imagined in a million years that we could even support a family on these songs that we were writing in our apartment, that wasn't even, it would, wouldn't even cross our minds at that point. And so all we knew to do was get in this truck that Charlie owned and just head anywhere anyone asked us to come to lead worship for free. And we just, that's what we did. And it was such a sweet time. We ended up making a record. Um, just a guy in our church let us borrow some money. And we put these songs, Charlie had half of them, and Nathan and I had the other half. And we just made this record called, Son we were called Sons and Daughters. And the song uh, that was sort of the flagship song of that was called Holy Roar, which was the song that I wrote when I fell face down on the carpet. And when that happened, um, and I was laying there, I never, that never really happened to me before. I'd never gotten a vision. Um, and I saw thousands of young people in a stadium 
And at that point, that had never happened as far as a gathering um, about Jesus. That's on, that had only happened, you know, for a football game or whatever. And so I'm laying there, and I'm, I'm seeing this, and it's this sound that's coming from these young people. And I just said out loud, it's a holy roar. It's a holy roar. And um, the song that kind of emerged um, from that moment um, was sort of the catalyst for these other songs. And we made this record. And then Louis Giglio, he and his wife Shelley were in Atlanta. His dad was on his deathbed. And they were praying about what was next. They had handed over their collegiate ministry in, at Baylor University in Texas and to go take care of his dad. But he died quicker than they, th they, th they thought. And so he was just kind of what's next, Lord, you know, and as they're praying, he, someone hands them, you know, bootleg copy of the Sons and Daughters, which was Nathan and Charlie and I, and, and he just told this story just a couple of weeks ago as Charlie and I led at Passion City, which was such a full circle moment, and he just talked about having to pull over on the side of the road, because he was like, who are these kids, basically, because they're praying the prayers, they're singing, basically, the prayers that we're praying, and of course, later and you know 20 almost 20 years next year will be the 20 year anniversary of passion conferences for collegiate generation and um after all this time it's just so sweet to look back and think wow you know god gave me just a picture of it in my my mind on the floor in our apartment that day of what was to come and um so many years of just getting to see um students um, on the edge of their seats with their lives in their hands saying, Jesus, you know, take my life. And so incredible. And that's how it all started. And, um, you know, we've just grown so much through the years. And a lot of that's been through pain and a lot of it's been through mistakes. And um, God uses refinement in such a beautiful way. And But I, it's so amazing. Um, don't fear getting older because it's awesome um, because you just, God just gives you new affection for things. And just, I have such affection in my heart for you. Um, and I didn't have that when I was in my twenties and my thirties. Um, I didn't understand that. And I think just more and more as you get older, it's just like, almost like he keeps dropping his heart in your heart for the generations that are coming up behind you. And so anyway, I just want to share kind of just, um, Really, I call it my farm table epiphany <laughs> that happened in my early, early 30s um, that changed the trajectory of my whole life as a mother, as a wife, as a worship leader. And I just want to share it because it's one of those things, I kind of call it a life shape. Um, you probably have something similar, like just that God has shown you through the years. It's like maybe it's your life verse and it's something you keep going back to over and over. For me, it has to do with my life verse, but it's sort of just this thing that unfolded, um, that still God just keeps giving me, um, words around it. And it's sort of just a place, I think, just to share from my journey. And, um, and I just have such a heart. I think you know, I love Tim, just the direction that, you know, we just, we, y'all don't know, but we went off the set list, um, which is awesome. Um, but I love it because it's, you know, um, our desire here, I think we would all collectively say, is for the kingdom to come. And I think we're all at a place where we're ready, um, especially just the state of our world. And I think we're all on the edge of our seats a bit, saying, here's our lives. And um, wanting so much for him to come and move among us. And so kingdom, you know, it it's it's such a word, I think, that I don't, I didn't understand for the, the longest time. And but I think, you know, the older I've gotten and I have kids, our son's 15, and it's, you know, I, we tell him all the time, they're like, we're like, Noah, there's just, there is a way that God made for us to walk in that produces, it, it's, it has to do with promise and it has to do with purpose. And if you walk in that way, it doesn't mean that everything's going to turn out exactly w the way you want it, but blessing, it commands a blessing as, as, you, as these pastors have shared and, and um, it's so so how I feel today, just sort of as someone who's walked a little bit ahead of some of you. Um, and I think some of you who are sort of my age and have been doing this a long time will understand and um, that there's this way that I think it's, I love to call it just a created order that God has made for us to live life from, literally. Um, 
just as like abiding is about salvation, I think abiding is also this sort of order to our mind and our heart every day of our lives in order to say, God, through my life, let the kingdom come to earth. And so um, I just, you know, always want to go back to the way that Jesus modeled this. And I think if he's the one we are you know, lifting high this weekend. He's the, the name that is above all names. And we also want to, I think, look at the way that um, he already modeled things. He's like, he's our ultimate example of life and leadership. He already did this for us. And often it just takes really studying the scripture, doesn't it? Just to see the way that, that Jesus did things, the way he led. And um, so I just want to just share, I'll kind of get into that farm table epiphany a little bit, but um, just this created order, um, things like seek first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. That's, there's an order to that. Um, in scripture, he tells us who we are before he asks us to do something. So there's, that's a theme. That's like an order in scripture. If you look all through just Old Testament, New Testament, um, you'll, if you kind of just are aware of that theme, it's all throughout scripture. Um, Colossians, Colossians 3.12 is a great example as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, put on compassion, kindness, patience. So often we skip over the, you know, you're like, as God's chosen one, holy and beloved, put on compassion. It's like, no, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, that's who you are. Then he's saying, put this on. So he's telling you who you are before he's saying, you can do this because of who you are. Um, and so what's the goal, as I said, is the kingdom coming to earth. And this is my favorite um, definition of kingdom that I've ever read. Um, it's from a book called Gospel Identity. Um, it says the kingdom of God is this. It's the renewing of all things. And as I'm reading this, just also think about it, because I was this morning as I was just reading over it again, like think about all the ways just that worship is central to these things um, in the kingdom coming to earth through our lives. Um, the kingdom of God is the renewing of all things. It's the reconciliation of relationships. It's the restoration of justice and equality. It's the freedom of every Lord except Jesus. It's about forgiveness, the defeat of Satan, compassion for the poor and powerless, helping those marginalized and rejected by society, using our gifts and resources for the advancement of others, new communities, it's about the transformation of society and culture. Does, does that sound like something you want to be a part of? Amen. And so that's the goal, right? And so Jesus said, seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added to you. Um, so this sort of life shape that kind of happened to me um, that got me to really get my eyes off of my thing, <laughs> of my thing, my brand, what I was doing, and to look around and go, okay, you're, the whole thing, the whole point isn't right now in this moment for us to get there. Yes, that will happen. Eternity will come. But Jesus' first words in the, in the beginning of his ministry was, um, repent for the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe. Um, and he said all the time, the king, he talked so much about the kingdom. And so he's invited us into this hasn't he for the reconciliation of all things and isn't worship so central in that um so we're invited into this him reconciling all things to himself and um a friend of mine her name's lauren chandler she's from texas and um, her husband's a pastor there and i was leading worship this was about 12 years ago um she came up to me afterwards and she's a very visual person and she just said as you were leading tonight I know this sounds strange but I saw a, like a target sign concentric circles and she was she was like I think it has something to do with Philippians 2 you're just you just need to pray about that I saw concentric circles like a bullseye and then like these outer rings and then I think it has something to do with Philippians 2 and at first I was like oh no God's convicting me for my target shopping habit um, I was like, I heard him, Lord. Um, there was probably a little truth to that, but, um, but where I was sitting sort of in this 
time of my life was that um, Nathan and I for several years were called Watermark and we traveled for about seven years, did about five records as Watermark on a label, a different label than I'm on now. And we had, you know, two little ones. Um, just as I said, I was sort of, um, you know, had booking agents and managers and tours and just the pace was crazy and had, you know, babies on the bus learning to walk and, you know, sleeping on the bus and things like that. And um, we were just exhausted. We were tired and um, I knew something needed to change. And so um, that was sort of where I was sitting in life when Lauren shared the concentric circles thing with me. And so I kind of went home and honestly, I forgot about it. And um, but the Lord had just been calling my heart, calling me through my heart just to um, consider a huge change. And that was to let go of this watermark journey. And um, at that point, we had, you know, had success, you know, in the eyes of the world, I guess. And um, even my parents were just like, really? You know, you really think that's what the Lord's saying? And, and I knew that God was calling me to come home and, and take care of my family, take care of my children when they're really small, especially. And um, I didn't, honestly, I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to cook. I, I didn't know how to do anything because my life was on a bus. And we did catering every night, you know. And so I, the Lord was calling my heart home. I remember, this is so strange, but I was upstairs in the bathroom, in the kids' bathroom, um, where our, you know, boy was like, constantly like trying to learn how to aim for the toilet and um I was cleaning that very toilet and <laughs> as I did this is very strange but this is how it happened this fulfillment came over my heart in this rest in this place of just just peace that I couldn't explain and it was just this desire and the Lord was like just come home I want you to trust me trust me with your journey trust me and so I went downstairs and I sat at my farm table and I was just like you know, I just had this tremendous feeling of peace while I cleaned a toilet. Um, Lord, what is going on? And so I opened up my Bible and flipped it straight to the middle, which is my life verse. It's Psalm 37. And I was saved through this verse. This was how my mother led me to the Lord because this verse was attached to like a little plaque that was in our house that had my name on it. It said, Christy, follower of Christ, and it had this verse on it, Psalm 37, 5, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he shall bring it to pass. So I'd memorized that as a seven-year-old, and that's how I was saved was through that verse. Um, so God brought me back there that, that morning, and so I start reading it. Verse 4 is right in front of that. It says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. But for the first time in my life, that word give jumped off the page at me, and I'd always sort of read that verse, which I think it's probably dual meaning, but like I've read that verse all my life. If I do these things for God, then he will do this for me. Basically, I have this thing in my heart that I think that I am supposed to do for the world and for him. And if I just, you know, do things for him, he'll do this for me. And I'd sort of kind of always read it like that. But for the first time, the Lord just, that word give, jumped out at me and he was like, Christy, I'm going to show you what your desires are. I will give you your desires. I'll put them in you for every season. And in this season, I'm giving you this desire to come off the road, and that's how you'll be able to explain it to people is you'll just say, all I know is I have the desire, and God is leading me to come home. And so, and then I went on. It said, commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn and the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. And I sat there just quiet because I, the Lord just, the, the Spirit of God just fell on me. And he just said, bullseye. He brought the concentric circles back. And he's like, bullseye, you come home and you spend time with me and spend time with your husband and your kids. And you watch me take care of these outer rings. The outer rings are mine. And you have been busying yourself and exhausting yourself trying to be in all of the rings and he said all I'm asking you to do and what I've given you grace for today is to hit the bullseye everything else is for me that's my glory and he just kept speaking into me he's like I put this gift in you it's mine to promote it's mine to lift up it's not your job to keep yourself on the map I will keep you on the map 
And so in that moment, I'm sitting there just crushed in the sweetest way and just broken over this word that he spoke over me. And so it was just started to unfold that day and after all these years, he still, it's just, it's, I call it my life shape. Every single day, I think about the bullseye. Every single day, I, even yesterday, I woke up, did a little interview thing in here, and it was, um, just before I go and share anything from my life, I just, just lay there, and I just, I go, Jesus, I put all my, my trust in you, my hope in you, and these outer rings of my life, all this stuff that I do for you, and it's all yours. And so um, as the years have unfolded, and if you have notes, I'd love for you to just jot it down, but um, he sort of just let this unfold, and I just want to give you, you know, sort of some things to put in this. If you want to even, if you have a little notepad, just draw a target sign. Uh, bullseye in the middle, um, and you can probably just remember it, but just put who. That's who you are in that bullseye. And through remembrance, really, is how we come to him every day. And it's through remembrance that we trust him for everything in our lives and that's going on. Um, I remember that word changed me. It changed my quiet time. So quiet time now is, I don't, I don't really go about trying to figure out what to do or to get a study together or whatever. I just start with, Jesus, I, rem I remember you, and that he leads me from there. Um, I remember who you are and what you have done. And um, So Jesus, if you think about it, modeled this. He, he knew who he was, didn't he? He knew he was intimate with the Father, and he knew what the Father had called him to do. He very much understood who he was and what he was there to do. Um, he often left the crowds, didn't he? He snuck in under the radar. He ministered under the radar. Often he would heal and be like, Shh, like, don't tell anyone. He knew who he was, and he knew that the Father would lift him up. He didn't lift himself up, did he? He modeled this. He knew who he was. Um, inside of that, who we are, you are beloved. So leading and even living is all from this place of you being called beloved. And um, Louis, our, our pastor, wrote a book called um, I Am Not, But I Know I Am, The Great I Am. And so he kind of breaks apart that word beloved, and I love it. He's, he says basically that word be, the first part of beloved, be, basically God is saying I exist. I be, um, when you break down that word, is basically I am that I am. And so if you think about him calling you beloved, he's saying, you are, I am that I am loved. You are be, he's like, I be, and you can't change that, can you? He exists, he, he bees. So you are be loved. Isn't that beautiful? You are God loved. And that's not changeable for you, that's fixed. Um, his love and his covenant inside of this, this is where you start every day, bullseye. His love and his covenant are not equal to your love for him and your commitment to him. His covenant, his covenant over you is greater than your commitment to him. His love for you is not equal. His love is otherly. Um, you are otherly loved um, by the great I am. So and isn't it beautiful when we see in the life of Peter, right? Peter denies him, but you see in his life that even though Jesus goes ahead, doesn't he, of Peter, after he denied him, meets him at Galilee, and later even says, I'm going to, or even before, I'm going to build my church on you. He knows and he's okay with the fact that your commitment to him and your love to him is not equal to his co covenant over you and his love over you. Um, and he's okay with that. And I think it's a beautiful thing every day to recognize Jesus that's the gospel. I'm not going to make it all the way to you today, but you already, the already of your story is that he already made it all the way for you. And that's Sabbath, isn't it? That's rest in your heart to say, Jesus, I can't, I'm not going to make it all the way today, but thank you that you already did. Um, that's your place to hide, that bullseye. 
Isn't that cool that we're hidden with Christ because he knew we would need a place to hide? So you don't have to hide anywhere else because you, he already made a place. You're already hidden with him. Isn't that beautiful? Um, I love Hebrews 4. It says, as long as there's today, you can enter the rest of God. Um, and part of that is trusting him to lift up your cause. It said, he will make your righteousness shine like the dawn and the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. He'll lift it up. So the next outer ring after the bullseye, you can put how in there. So we have who in the middle and how. So through relationship, um, really starting from that place of beloved as your starting point. So um, this isn't just like a daily thing for me. It's sometimes like an hourly <laughs> hourly thing for me to go back to beloved and start with my belovedness and lead from my belovedness and love my kids and my husband from my belovedness. Um, and what ends up happening is it just when you're living from that place in your mind and in your heart, it's just your belovedness spills over on to them. So yeah, you emerge from, I like to say, that bullseye, who you are. You emerge to that and this is how you now, this is how we relate to God. So I love it. We, were, we emerge from beloved, and this is our most authentic voice and our most authentic self. I've watched this over and over. I, I kind of call it like um, just spiritual singing lessons because I've literally watched it happen. Um, there's a sweet, precious friend of mine, Molly. She's led with us at Passion for the past like six years. Um, I watched this happen to her in her life, literally. People were like, what happened to you? Like, you sing different. All of a sudden, when she started living from that true place of beloved and trusting God with her cause, her voice changed. And I'm not even kidding. I had a small group of young worship leader women, and one of them, even across the room, said, Molly, what is with you? Like, something has changed in you, and you sing different. And it was because I literally knew, because she was vulnerable with me to tell me the journey, she was singing now from this place of beloved, and it was—it literally was like the most gorgeous thing, and it changed her her voice. Like it was her most authentic voice. She was like coming from that hiding place, and it was just like, just jaw dropping, amazing. Um, so we we relate to God through this place of remembrance and who we are and who He is. We now relate to Him in that way. So our obedience is a response rather than a means of approval for him, for us. So our, our obedience, yes, we want to obey, but it's a response of that belovedness of going, okay, God, I come back to that place of beloved, and so now I, I want to obey you because I can't even believe that you call me the great I am loved. And our obedience is now not this means of like, are you happy with me? Are you happy with me? It's like, God, I just, all I want to do is please you. I just, I, just, I love you. Um, so we begin to also relate to others through this remembrance. And so if you kind of start in that bullseye, it's how you relate to God, and it's how you relate to others. And this is such a key part, and this is what God's been doing in me, and I think that this is where the Philippians 2 thing came in when Lauren said that to me. She was like, yeah, I think it has something to do with Philippians 2. And she was right. Um, so... When we begin to relate to others through remembrance, who God is, I'm beloved, he's got me, what we end up doing is if we're trusting him with our own cause, it frees us to what? Like, look into the interest of others, which is Philippians 2. So it was the first time the Lord was like, hello, there's people all around you. There are young women who want to hear how you lead and how you mother, and they want to come into your home and see how this happens. And... I've raised you up to raise them up. And so if you're trusting me with your cause, then now you've got some time, don't you, on your hands. You don't have to be in all those outer rings anymore because I got it. So I've got these girls geographically that I've placed around you. And so I didn't know what else to do, but all I started doing was having retreats in my home for worship leaders. I just started reaching out and finding worship leader women. And I was like, I don't know, do you want to come to my house and spend the night? It was really strange. But that, um, <laughs> thankfully, God used it in like a really sweet way. And um, we're all still like the best of friends to this day. Um, but I just was like, okay. It was like all of a sudden I was like, I just had energy for people because I was like well, trusting him with my thing. I was trusting him with my cause. And I was like, God, you have this. And so now I'm like, what do you need? Okay. What do you need? You know, I was able to be like, 
just noticing, you know, these young worship leader women who are around me, and I was like, oh, hey. Um, so, yeah, Jesus modeled this, didn't it? Think about didn't he? Think about it. He had those few, didn't he? He brought near. He had the disciples. And what did he do? He shared everything. He didn't hold back. He invited them into everything, and he said, do this. He gave them the, the, the power to heal. He invited them in, didn't he? And he brought them in. He brought them close. He communed with them. He was, yes, he went away and went, and went back to the Father, didn't he? He went to the bullseye. He would often go get in a boat and go be with the Father. But then he would also bring the few close, didn't he? So beautiful. Um, and this is, he used his surroundings. You know, Jesus, all those things in the Bible, you know, my dad's been good about teaching me those things of just like, yeah, he, he talked about fishermen a lot because this was where they lived, didn't he? He talked about vineyards a lot because this is, you know, and the water source would have been this, and this is why. So it's always about like, look, see, you know, he's, He's always like, this is the surroundings. And that's how God wants to use you as well. Um, your own refinement in your life and your growth, your spiritual growth, is not for you to hoard. It's all for the sharing. And God has geographically placed people in your area, in your church. And your refinement is your language of discipleship. Um, and that's the beauty of it. There's no... Um, there's no like 101, it's, it's, it's different. Isn't that beautiful? Because he made each one of you, he wired every one of you differently. And only you can lead that one person that he's geographically brought close to you and your refinement that God's taking you through and you sharing it willingly and freely, that's your language for discipleship. And isn't it beautiful? Because it just takes all of our different lives, doesn't it? Um, he's bringing people close to you for that reason. Um, and he wants you to notice them. He wants you to trust him with your thing. Um, the kingdom is upside down. Um, small is big. Last is first. Um, so don't trade getting to have a presence in someone's life to stake your ground and your position. Um, I think the number one way that you could become irrelevant as a worship leader, and I, I know this because I was on the edge of that becoming a danger for me, um, is stake your claim. You know, just stake your claim with where you're at and just be like, this is my thing, this is my brand. Um, but if you want to stay relevant, you think about it. Jesus said make disciples, didn't he? If you want to stay relevant here's what will happen is you're going to pour into the life of other people and he's going to lift you up. The kingdom of God is upside down. It's opposite of what we think we should do. It's not about here's my brand and I'm going to, you know, social media this to, you know, the hilt. It's no, he said, make my joy complete in being like-minded and be in unity and look into the interests of others and not just your own. Consider others high, more highly than yourself. That's what Jesus did, didn't he? He was a servant. Um, I saw this again. Just I, I'm getting to experience that. I remember where I was standing um, the night that Molly, as I was just telling you, the, you know, her authentic voice is coming out. And I remember she led at this conference that we had for leaders and I was literally over on the side, and I was just sobbing, and I was like literally about, my knees were about to buckle underneath me because I felt this joy that I had never experienced before, just knowing that I had walked with her since she was 18, and she's 30 now, and it was like I got to be like a small part of seeing her most authentic voice come out, and I just was over there just I was literally shouting and just having a party like over on in the dark on the side. And the Lord was like, Jesus, it just, he brought Philippians too. He's like, complete my joy. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. It's like a mothering feeling that comes over you, a fathering feeling that you get to watch people get raised up. And it's just miraculous. It's beautiful. And even Brooke that's with me, um, I've just gotten to be a part of her life, and I get to watch her lead. Um, and it's just, um, there's nothing like it when you get to just pour into people and just get to see what God is doing through them. So this last ring, it's called, you can put what. 
So we've got who, how, and what. And really, I like to just say this is our response ability. Um, I want us to look at that word in just a little bit of a different way. Literally, like, we have the ability to respond. And so instead of, like, we're in all the outer rings and we're taking care of our own thing all the time and we're running ragged, um, what this looks like when you start from that place of beloved in your heart every day and, and then you you merge into um, the how, which is how you're relating to God every day and how you're relating to others. Isn't it beautiful that you take others with you into what you're doing? And that's what Jesus did, didn't he? He took the disciples with him into kingdom. And so this last outer ring is what I love to just call like Ephesians um, 2.10. It's um, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that were prepared prepared for us when, like in advance, right? So what I walked into even just being here, I've learned is um, this was prepared in advance for me. And how did I know I was supposed to come? It's because I was in this place of beloved with Jesus, right, and trusting him. It helps you understand how to say yes to things. It helps you understand how to say no to things. Because in this beloved place, you're getting your kingdom assignments, aren't you? If you're dwelling and being with the Father and being intimate with him, and that's, you're like, Jesus, I just want to sit with you. Um, I'm going to, rem it's remembrance today that your covenant's greater than anything that I could bring you today. Thank you, God. You made me beloved. And I've got these amazing people that you've given me around me. And thank you for them. And thank you that we get to co-labor together now. And so that outer ring is these, it's what we do. It's what we just did here. This is the outer ring. Um, but it's, it's, it's kingdom things prepared in advance. It's good works that I know that I was supposed to walk in because I had a peace in walking into it because I knew from being in that place of beloved that I was supposed to be here. And you all know what it feels like when you say yes to something that you shouldn't have said yes to, and you're in the outer ring and you're exhausted, and then it doesn't go well, does it? You're exhausted. It just leaves you exhausted. Um, so it's that order, isn't it? This created order that I believe gives us kingdom capacity in the upside down way. It's not start with just going a thousand miles an hour and just go for it all the time. It's no, it's coming back to that place, even if it's just for four minutes in the morning, that place of beloved. Um, and so I love it just to think about it this way. I've heard it said that we get to just respond to his ability. So these outer rings is just, at that point, we just get the joy to get to just respond to him and just say, Oh, my word, I'm beloved. Oh, my goodness, you've made me beloved. I'm trusting you with my cause, and I'm watching you um, lift me up in places that I never could have even imagined. Or And it's in these small and precious little groups of something or just a coffee between you know me and another person. It's like these small things become these huge things, and it's just it's beautiful. Um, and I love it, and even Tim, you know, just prayed it earlier, and it really, that outer ring is that remembrance of it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit. And um, it really is, I think that's what walking in the spirit looks like, is um, model is how Jesus modeled it. It's that intimacy with the Father. It's this is how I relate to him and others, and then this is what I'm called to do. Um, and so, yeah, I, the sweetest part of just sort of this thing unfolding is just sort of recently, again, it's just like more and more, and I'll close with this, but, um, you know, we can get stuck in those outer rings. I was stuck in there for a long time. And I think in that place, um, we can experience um, what I really think the enemy, the lie is like diminishment. How many of you just literally would be honest to raise your hand and say, like, in the last couple of weeks, you have had feelings of, like, fatigue and diminishment and failure? Would anyone say, like, the enemy's lied about that? Like, you're done. 
you're, it's over. Yeah, he likes that one. Um, but what can also happen in, you know, that, those outer, just if you're stuck, not going back to that place and living from that belovedness is just um, grasping. Um, when you start looking at your siblings, brothers and sisters in Christ, as um, competition and there's jealousy and comparison and um, you grasp for things, right? You're striving. But what beauty, right, when we're trusting him? Um, quick story. Uh, so when we folded Watermark, we stopped. Everything came off the road. It was, I was home for about three years. We decided to move to Atlanta. We were selling the house. That day, the house, um, we were having the inspection. I had to leave. That night um, was the Dove Awards, which is this, you know, award ceremony in the States for contemporary Christian music. And, of course, I'd been off the radar for three years, not on a label, no manager, um, no booking agent, nothing. And, um, and I was okay. I was just minding my business. I was being a mom and just having these retreats with strangers at my house. And um, but it was so sweet. I remember getting a call um, a couple of weeks before the Dove Awards, and um, just they asked, they said, hey, would you um, come and lead this song with um, Michael W. Smith, who was, we were on his label. We were friends with Michael, and it was a song I had sung on on a record that he had done that previous year. And, and I loved the song, and I was like, I would love to do that. That's, that's sweet, yeah. I was like, I have a lot going on, but, you know, I'd, I would love to do that, and and so what's crazy is that most artists, um, their labels have to pay for that slot. Um, you know, a lot of money sometimes goes into their artists kind of getting that prime spot to be on the show or whatever. You know, and here's me just like changing dappers at home, like I'm just like, you know, what Dev Awards, what? And um, I show up and. Um, and I walk out on the stage, and I didn't know what the the set was going to be. Or, um, and I walked out, and and it was just a lot of my my friends. You know, Chris Tomlin was there, and um, Israel Houghton, and um, Stephen Curtis Chapman, and um, Paul Blosh, and um, you know. And I just found myself. I had the sweetest time just reconnecting with them, and like getting to lead that song that night. And it was just the sweetest, you know picture I think of the Lord just like if you trust me you know I'll put you in the right place at the right time um, with the people that you love and you know most people all their managers and booking agents are you know on the phone all day trying to get you know these slots and stuff and the Lord's like yeah I got her I got you you stay home and take care of your babies and I'll take care of the outer rings I got you and if I want you here singing a song, and then you're going to be here. And it's all going to be all right, and you're going to love it, and there's going to be joy from it, and it's going to be easy for you because my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and I'm going to hold up your cause. Um, and as this little life shape, and I'll close with this, I, I promise. <laughs> um, as it's unfolded, just the most recent thing, you know, I was just um, reading uh, some light reading. It's called Seven Fire Anointings. Um, it's just light reading. That was a joke. Um, but yeah, we were just at this uh, church in um, Edmonton, um, actually, um, about a month ago. So the pastor of that church wrote this book, and it was in our hotel room. And um, I was just struck by this as beautiful, because I think really, um, too, tonight, I just had on my heart that I felt like, because um, I know this has happened to me, but I, I think often when we're stuck in that place of not um, living from beloved, I think really the ultimate lie really is that Satan wants to get us, like, getting our needs met in illegitimate ways. And when I think of that, I think, you know, he wants you to feel as if you're an illegitimate child, that you, you're not the beloved, right? He hates us. He wants us to feel orphaned. And he wants us actually to have an orphan mentality and and so really what I felt tonight that, um, and I think it's already happened in this room to a bunch of people, I felt like it was happening earlier, but just that I think what God wants to do is just um, for us to ask him again, just for a fresh um, feeling of 
really um, that spirit of sonship, you know, that we cry Abba, and that we would um, emerge every day into kingdom things, all those things I listed that we want so much to be a part of and want our lives to be about for the kingdom of God to come to earth. But many of us so tired, fatigued, um, in the back of our minds always like, yeah, but I need to, you know, do this, and we got this brand, and we got a social media this, and we got to tweet this and Instagram this. and But really, I just, what if we were asking every day, like, God, would you just birth in me like a spirit of sonship so that I could live from that place um, and approach his house as a son and not a slave? Because I feel like the enemy would want us to feel shackled to even our ministry, right? Jesus said, my burden is light. My yoke is easy. And he's called you into something that is breath and joy, completing his joy. Um, I read this and loved it. It says, um, a relationship with God can be viewed as an elementary stage in spiritual development. Uh, sorry, a law relationship. This is like a law relationship versus a love relationship with God. So slave versus son, really. A law relationship with God can be viewed as an elementary stage in spiritual development. So we all need that. We need the law. Um, it was. It's a preparatory place of the sonship relationship. And due to our carnal nature and selfish tendencies, the law serves as a training ground for growth in Christ. As it performs its duty, restraining us in the matter of sin, the law becomes burdensome and wearying and impels us to seek a greater liberty, a higher way of life. Compare the natural realm. Often the childhood or youth stage of development is punctuated more by a law relationship with the parents than a love relationship. The child chafes against the parents. He complains and lives by rules and regulations. The relationship is low level and bumps along more by constraint than by blessing and joy. Once, however, the child truly understands the inheritance available if he walks in a sonship spirit, the law constraint falls to the side and a father-son blessing rises in its place. The same is true concerning the Heavenly Father and His children. We must progress beyond the restraint of the law to the blessing of a sonship relationship. Galatians 3, 23 and 24, this says, We were kept under guard by the law. The law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. The Galatians passage, chapters 3 and 4, relates first to a contrast between law and grace. Secondly, is intended Secondly, is an intended application comparing a slave and a son. Law relationship with God is a slave's life. Love relationship is a son's life. A slave lives by imposition, by domination, by rules. A son lives by freedom, by honor, and by willingness. In our spiritual development, we must rise out of childhood into a mature relationship with God. Sonship is liberty. Sonship is life. David Wilkerson wrote, The law is not intended for the person whose obedience springs out of a desire to please God. He is not concerned about what is legal or illegal, what is permitted or forbidden. He has only one criterion. What does my Lord desire? You can lay out all the law before him, all the rules, regulations, and prohibitions, and he will say, You don't have to tell me not to do these things. I wouldn't do anything to hurt my father. I love him. I've already forsaken the world and its lust to go after him whom my heart desires. Show me what he wants, not just what he forbids. I want his heart's desire to become my actions. I want to know his mind and obey it. Sure, I love his law, but that's for the lawless, for those who haven't come into the knowledge of intimacy with Christ. I have another law at work in my heart. It's the law of love, one that says, Lord, what can I do to please you today? Isn't that beautiful? Um, So I want us to just pray because I just felt like that would be such a fitting thing to do. Um, 
asking for that spirit of sonship in your life and going back to that place of beloved and emerging and living from that place and leading from that place of being loved. And maybe you need to come out of an agreement with a lie that the enemy has just over and over, or maybe even people in your life have spoken over you that has sort of fed that orphaned or slave mentality, or even if you don't do these things, then you're just, you're not going to stay on the map. I'm not going to be able to use you. You, you got to go, 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 go. You got to stay in the merry-go-round and you got to do all these things and But instead, the Lord is saying, I've got you. <laughs> I know you. Only I can put my thumbprint down on you because I made you. I intricately wired you. And then I showed you how to do it with my son. He came to the earth and he, he led the way that he wants us to lead. He was intimate with the Father. and He served with joy and gladness. And and then invited us into kingdom things. And then what did he say? He said, greater things will you do. I'm going to go to the Father, but greater things will you do. Because he knew the Spirit of God would come. And that the Holy Spirit in us, that we would do great and mighty things as sons and daughters of the living God.